Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> we have a really uh, uh, distinguished panel over here. Uh, two folks who are entrepreneurs actually running businesses, and some of them, um, you know, very successful ones, and two investors. So we'll have a good perspective. As the topic for this panel is around growth hacking, we want to get to that part of uh, of, of growing a SaaS business. So. Uh, we want to make this about 30, 40 minute session uh, where we kind of talk about the specific experiences, but we really want to hear from the audience on what is on your mind in terms of the specific challenges you're facing around thinking about your business. So as, as was just said, please, you know, uh, through the session, keep your questions ready, keep bringing them, and we'll try to make this as much uh, as interactive as possible. So uh, to get started off, uh, I wanted to get a little bit of flavor uh, on each of the panelists, what are the specific backgrounds, um, especially around the SaaS businesses. So I'm going to ask each person to really just sort of dig into their specific backgrounds with emphasis on uh, the SaaS businesses that either they've been involved in or they've invested in. So let me just start with Venkat and then we just go uh, one by one. Good morning. Uh, I spent close to 25 years in the U.S. and moved back to India about two years ago. And um, I've been in Wall Street and uh, a CEO and uh, entrepreneur in the Bay Area. Of relevance to cloud and SaaS, uh, I ran a management strategy consulting firm focused on cloud and uh, software as a service uh, with a wide range of clientele, all the way from uh, large corporations like British Telecom to small startups in the SaaS space. And of late, I uh, personally invested in a couple of SaaS companies. And uh, my perspective is much more on watching uh, how companies uh, make it, what works, what doesn't work, uh, and what kind of metrics, and how do you scale up the business effectively. That's uh, what I bring to the table. Um, I am CEO and founder of Nolarity Communications. It's, uh, um, a small and medium-sized business uh, productivity solution provider in India and you know focused on emerging markets as well. My specific background, I'm IIT Kanpur graduate 2000 batch in computer science and then uh, had MBA in US, work for McKinsey and Company. Uh, started Nolarity Communication in 2009, uh, it's been three and a half years. It's a SaaS company, uh, we provide hosted PBX and other business productivity tools. Uh, which use telephony as a, actually a communication uh, or computing or communication channel um, uh, for SMBs. Uh, close to 300 people now in the company, uh, more than 5,000 customers. Very, very interesting journey trying to sell to SMBs in India, you know, something, uh, 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 business productivity tools. Um, the, the learnings around unit economics, uh, learnings around simplicity, learnings around usage, learning around, you know, uh, providing real, real value to the SMBs who is not going to give you money uh, if you do not provide 10x, you know, of what you're charging. So that is what our our journey in Nolarity has been and we are trying to scale it up from India to other emerging markets, which is Southeast Asia and Latin America. Great. Fantastic. Yeah, so, uh, you know, at Nexus, uh, we manage three funds uh, across $600 million. We've done uh, about a dozen investments in SaaS uh, across uh, you know the three funds, starting with our first investment. Actually, our first investment was a SaaS company, open source company called Dindim, and uh, we've been uh, active since then. We have office in the U.S. as well, and so we invest in companies uh, across both geographies. Uh, uh, I would say a lot of our investments in SaaS have actually been in the U.S. market right now, and we can talk about some of the reasons why that has been the case, uh, but. Uh, we continue to look for opportunities like Dimdim. Dimdim was actually a company that was started in India, in Hyderabad, and built a very good platform. So uh, we continue to look for opportunities here. Uh, we'll talk about more when we. Sure, great. Kaushik? Hi, I'm Kaushik Thakkar. Sorry for the accent, Swedish accent. Uh, so I look Indian, uh, born in Africa, ended up in Sweden, totally tech geek. Sunija, my co founder, has made, so I comb my hair, a uh, very shirt to this event. Uh, my background is from the Royal Institute of Technology. Uh, Sweden is very technology oriented. There's hardly any sunlight during winter. So you have these Ericsson's. They are so pri proud with nine million people. They build their own jet fighters, submarines, etc. cetera. Um, so after doing my master's in computer science, I did security, high tech, very high tech security, Swedish defense. 
And then I was let out, so I built the first couple of online banks for security um, in Sweden. Uh, then we founded Portwise, uh, a company founded from Sweden. Uh, fairly tough. It was a news ecosystem 10 years back. Swedish software companies were not strong. Uh, we started in March 2000. Everything crashed. We worked very hard, but we raised about $30 million, me and my two other founders. Sweden, 9 million people couldn't sell so much, so I came to India first time to sell in 2003. I went to every single corner in India, from Chennai, Coimbatore. I, there was no small partner. I met everyone. And we were quite successful. So before I moved from Port West to US, we had about 65% market share in our segment because we understood what the people wanted. After 10 years Portwise, I met Ron Conway, the American Silicon Valley guys, rock stars. I said, no, I'm not a rock star. Let me do technology. Europe was crashing. Uh, India was booming. We thought one third of all Silicon Valley tech startups have Indian DNA. So we're thinking, how is this possible? So we saw an unfair advantage and we said, let's do technology, high tech, everything in India, uh, have focused on women. So today we have 35% women in our organization and let's start from there. So that's been my journey. Do angel investments because I think you have to support the ecosystem. I've lost in angel investment, 93% of the cases, you lose money. So you have to have another purpose than money when you invest. So I did consumer internet. Uh, I've done, I have it right now, a fashion a TV investment with women. Uh, I've done mobile internet, uh, families doing investments in portals. Uh, but my full-time job right now, uh, so I was promoted to CEO in March after working in product market fit. And this panel is actually very, very good. Thanks. Great. Thank you. <coughs> So that's a, a very wide variety of background, and I want to kind of get into uh, the specifics and try to give the audience a flavor of the specific things that people have been working on. So I'd like to start with Amrish. Um, I'd love for you to describe, uh, you know, so our discussion over here is going to be how you're going to scale beyond where you are today. But it sounds like in the discussion that we've had, you kind of feel that you've, you've got a very large customer base. It's a 300-person organization. Uh, what are the things that you went through to kind of get to this phase where you feel like you've understood the market, you've got a product market fit? Uh, how do you feel confident about the fact that you have reached your inflection point where now growth uh, is, is where you need to get, uh, to get to? How do you get confidence around that? Um, it's, it's a long journey, really. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, um, it's, 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 uh, it's a combination of the, the numbers that you get from the market um, of, 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 the, of your customer data. And you know, foolhardy confidence of an entrepreneur, the combination of that, uh, that, that, is, that is what allows you to do that. Um, for us, um, uh, we had started out with a very, very top-down approach. Um, uh, the idea was that um, uh, the, uh, in India, uh, the telephony penetration has happened, everybody has telephone, um, uh, so people must be calling businesses now on phone, right? So their businesses must be receiving a lot of phone calls, but they're receiving the phone calls on Nokia phones, right? Um, so there is no business productivity solution, really. They, they need some way to manage it. Um, uh, second thing is this telephony thing has happened in India last five years. So it's kind of just things have just changed. So uh, every time things change in a very macro way, uh, you have big opportunities come up. Um, third was I was sitting in US uh, looking at US economy growing with 0% growth rate. And you look at Indian economy growing by 13% growth rate, right? Um, so you, you see look, two or three massive macro things combining. Emerging markets, telecom growing 100%. Suddenly everybody has telephone people calling businesses. And then you look at the businesses in India and see they have no productivity solution, really. They don't use any computing, uh, really business computing at all. So the combination of these three is what made me uh, leave my job uh, in McKinsey in US and then come back to India and say, you know, let's figure out something here. And I did not really know the exact product uh, when we started. Um, um, experiment, experimentation, M MVP, you know, is pretty much just basically having a small IVR and going out talking with people, getting very good response. That is where it kind of got started. Um, I think that was the first stage. Uh, where you get a little bit of confidence that something like this can work. Um, the second stage is uh, you give up, give this kind of product, a very, very basic product to the market and you, there's a very, very wide excitement and response uh, that we managed to get. So I remember talking with 11 companies uh, in July 2009, I came back 
and out of which nine really, really wanted it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that, that is the confidence that we got from the market that something like this is needed and that is actually where we started investing in technology and started building it up. So that was the second stage. Um, the third stage uh, was packaging the product and starting selling to SMBs. Um, so from enterprise, 11 customers, 9 customers wanting it, you kind of package it out and look at the large SMB market and say, said, you know, can, would these kind of people need a hosted PBX kind of product? And we send out actually a newsletter, email newsletter um, to 1,000 uh, SMBs. And we, I remember we've got like 70, 80 responses, which was a very, very strong response that we got. So at every stage, at least the initial first two years, it was very, very market response driven. And then every time we get very strong market response, we would go back and take the technology to the next level. So, so there was a, there's a really active involvement from you, from the, from the sales side, from the product side, to sort of get that product. And I'm sure that your product went through a lot of iterations uh, through that time period. So maybe tell us, what did you start with and maybe where are you today in terms of the specific product offering? How did that change and, and now you feel, okay, you got it right. What is it today uh, and how is it different from when you started out? I, I think in, in the beginning, really, um, it's um, so, so the, the couple, in SaaS business, you need a couple of units to kind of work out properly uh, if you want to scale. One is a product unit whether the product is right and is being used properly. Uh, the second is, I think, the customer acquisition engine, right? What is unit economics of that? You know, well, will, if that is working out properly or not. Third, I think what I call is operation engine. Uh, so what is your cost of serving the customer, whether that is working properly? So all these three need to work. And um, in the beginning, it's all kind of combined. Uh, the point at which you can think about, or any SaaS business I think can think about, is scaling it up, is that there's a tick mark in all these three. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in case of product economics, I think uh, uh, there has to be very high level excitement on the initial set of the customer, and one should not go and acquire a large number of customers before that. You know, 50, 60 customers for SMBs, you know, uh, we are talking about, just to stick to them and kind of tweak the product until there's actually a glint in the eyes right, of the customers. Right. They're using it pretty much on a daily basis and say, you know, if you take it away from me, I'll kill you. Uh, right. kind, kind of excitement created. Uh, th that, that needs to be, the, uh, that is, I would say, tick mark on product economics. Uh, tick mark on sales acquisition economics is uh, in SaaS business is, um, in our case, we take 12 months money in advance. Mm -hmm. It's a prepaid business. Uh, for us, it was very, we, we were very clear that we wanted it to be cash positive customer acquisition, mm -hmm. <coughs> which is I acquire a customer and I get some cash as well. Got it. No, that's a that's very great uh, sort of points over here. Uh, Kaushik, uh, so you've been involved now uh, in, uh, in, in two businesses. Uh, so maybe if you can describe from your perspective when you feel your businesses are ready at that inflection point, what does that mean for you? Yeah. As I mentioned, I'm Swedish and more academic. So when we build businesses, we talk about the pie theory, at least my theory. The pie theory is that when you have your version 3.14 out, then if you've done your homework, then it will work out with the products. So if I give example, my first company, Portwise, started in Sweden 2000, uh, initial customer acquisitions, big uh, enterprises like insurance companies, banks, same year, and we used them uh, to make the first versions of the product. And when the product was hitting version three, then we went for global expansion. Navalis is more typical. Uh, the first version of the product, like Amrish said, uh, we said, where can we build a product? And we want to be very geographically restricted. So we chose Mumbai, and we chose the office in Under East, where there are like 5,000 SMBs. But the good thing with the SaaS model is that it enables smaller businesses to get the technology which uh, they don't have to invest that much in, uh, which wasn't available before. So we built the first version uh, of the product there, went to the 50 SMBs with feet on street and all these things. Uh, and then we found out a lot of use cases. And I'll show you how we went through. So the first version product, we missed out one big thing. The big thing was that people need multiple internet connections. They have a BSNL first because it's cheaper, but BSNL is not stable. So they have either wireless internet or something else coming in. And then I looked at, the, we have a hardware piece, returns, what was that for? In Mumbai, if you have fans, they get clogged. Uh, and then we saw it's simplicity. Uh, so after going through all these versions of the product and feet on street, 
what we arrived at on the network appliance was that in India you need something without moving parts, uh, supporting wireless internet, uh, completely sealed, uh, and also moving out from the data room because most customers don't have a data room. So you have to wall mount it to support those technologies. Uh, and after coming to version 3.14, we completely drastically changed the sales model because in the beginning you can't give it to SI uh, because they won't be able to take the product. There'll be a lot of quality issues uh, onto it. And you also need a lot of stability. Features people are okay with, but stability has to be 100% on the product uh, completely. So we removed all feet on street. In that stage when I took over, the feet on street team had about 100 customers in pipeline. Uh, and we're saying, okay, this is not scalable, unit economics not working. We scaled back to one and a half salesperson, signed an SI, and now five months afterwards, the pipeline is 8,000 units. Uh, which shows the inflection point. And what we did was we found a product market fit. So it went to SIs. SIs need to win big projects. And we found a niche with multiple uh, distributed organizations because that's the power of the cloud. Uh, and then find a, a vertical approach to it. So we see the inflection points are there. What were the same inflection points? We found a product market fit where people were publishing applications over internet and wanted security without a client and needed two-factor authentication. It was simple. So we actually invented two-factor authentication through SMS where Yes Bank was the first customer, but we did it in Sweden. Fantastic, great. So Sandeep, uh, you know, you've invested in a couple of com uh, companies yourself uh, as the lead investor of, of, of Nexus. You know, how do you look at companies that are kind of hitting this inflection point? What are the factors that you're looking at as a board member and as an investor in the companies? Yeah, I, I think Amrish uh, raised uh, some very critical points that uh, you know, anybody here that is setting up SaaS companies should be thinking about. So you know, if you read any of the blogs, on SaaS, everybody talks about you know customer acquisition costs and you know lifetime value of a customer. Those are the two terms that you keep hearing about. But as a person who's running the business on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you actually get to an objective view on what those numbers are? And uh, so, when as a board member, what we typically do is you know uh, work with the CEO in making sure that there's objectivity in how you calculate those numbers. Right? It's, it's more. As an as a entrepreneur, you will be always more optimistic in my CAC is low and my LTV is high because you want to show that you know, that's the reason why you're building this business. And as a board member, that's where we sort of come back and say, okay, let's, let's go through this and really understand what, the, what are you seeing in the market. And one of the advantages of SaaS is the fact that you, know, you can actually see how customers are, particularly if it's a public cloud-based product, you can actually see how the customer is using your product. So you can do a lot of analytics on the back end to see product usage and you know what parts of the products have been used, what what is you know uh, what could be improved, what where is the flow of usage and so on, which is extremely critical in, in terms of you know Kaushik was saying that this product you know version 3.14. I think there is a there is a lot of iteration that you can do in in SaaS because of the analytics that you run on the back end. So. It's very critical that as you're building your product from the start, you know, you need to put this in so that you know when the usage starts happening, you can start hitting the, the sales engine faster. So uh, one part of this is, is just the metrics and, you know, the, yeah. the, the specific things that you talked about. But uh, as a, you know, the entrepreneur is probably, you know, being very aggressive, wanting to sort of, you know, push and say, you know, my LTV is high, CAC is low, I've got everything else. But there are other issues around, uh, let's say the services element of the business which also complete the offering. There is an organization structure which is uh, ready. Uh, so from a board member perspective, the, you know, the entrepreneur is saying, give me money, I want, I want to step on the gas. And you are saying no, because. No, so uh, you know, again, this goes back to, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're trying all different means to target the market. So you know, we can talk about everything from direct sales, inside sales, you know, channel, SI, you know, there are various routes you can take, each of which have an impact on your costs and an impact on your understanding of the, of the market. So if you have a direct sales force, obviously you can get the most direct understanding of the market because the person is out there interacting with the customer on a day-to-day -day basis, but the cost of that is very high. So in a starting point, you may do that because you yourself are selling, right? So you are the, you are the salesperson, your cost is built into the company, you know, you're, you're, you know, most of you are not taking salaries. So there's no cost, right? So you just assume that. But we, you know, in the earlier panel, we talked about the fact that 
as you bring in more sales people, your costs go up higher than what you expect because the productivity of the salesperson is low initially, right? And, so, but the, and you are also paying them. So how do you take that into account when you're looking at scale? So a person may come back and say, hey, I'm seeing a lot of traction in terms of, uh, you know, I've managed to sell to 40 customers or 50 customers. Now I want to build a sales force and I want to hire these six guys, each of them costing, you know, half a million dollars to go build this out. And you're saying, okay, fine, but how did you sell? Can you replicate that with the six people you plan to hire? How quickly will they come up to speed? So it's, it's have you put the standard operating procedures in place from a sales perspective to, to scale that up, right? So you're asking these questions of the entrepreneur. So there's also a lot obviously about uh, organization design, processes in the company, all those yeah. issues are also as critical. <clears throat> yeah, so the replicability of <clears throat> what you have done to get to your lower CAC or to get to your lifetime value, I think the replicability of that is very critical, right? You can do that if you're doing it, you can, you know, you can potentially have a great inside sales guy who's selling on your behalf. You can have a very good channel, one channel partner that's selling for you. But can you get five channel partners? Can you really do this? nationwide or globally, can you get you know other channel partners that are available who can replicate what you did with one? And even if it's just one, is that one large enough to take you to the next level in terms of growth? Great. So when could come to you, uh, you know, you've been involved in companies both as consultant, as an investor, and you had an interesting perspective that your focus is really on numbers. So you know, maybe if you can, with specifics of companies that you can talk about, love to hear your thoughts on what do you look at? Personally, I'm a believer, still I'm a very big believer in the SaaS model. I mean, it makes so much sense. The only issue has been timing and uh, I started a consulting firm five years ago with the expectation it's going to take off. It's taken a little longer, but uh, I'm still convinced this is the right model to go. And uh, as an investor, I'm still looking for my sales for uh, NetSuite. Hasn't happened, but uh, haven't given up hope. Uh, one of the things I found among a lot of my uh, companies where I interacted, either as a consultant or as an investor, uh, signs look good. Uh, oh, there is excitement, people are signing up, etc. But something happens at the time when it's about to set off, we think it's going to, there's going to be the hockey stick coming and it never comes. And uh, when we stepped back and I looked at all the companies who didn't really make it, certain common patterns, themes uh, jumped out. Uh, one is quality of revenues. So not all revenues are equal. And uh, when you really go open the, you know, under the covers, you look at the various components, what's the CAC, what's, you know, how much the cost is, and what's the LTV for this particular customer, and what's the CAC, etc. Uh, it became quite apparent that uh, not all revenues are good, uh, not all revenues are equal. And so, I would strongly encourage people to really focus on the quality of revenues and is this like something that is healthy and it is uh, going to be effectively scaling up for the business. Uh, second point I felt was um, people jump in without trialing because uh, to the points made earlier, you got to really make sure that your product is right with a smaller segment of the customer base where you can make a lot of iterations and making sure the product is right before you push the throttle and uh, push it ahead. Because if you go down too far down the path and you're going to be ending up losing a lot of money and there are not many options left out there. Uh, the third point, at least as a board member investor I look for is uh, most companies the initial cost of acquisition is high and they get to do it because of subscription model it takes quite some time for them to recover. Uh, unlike your case where, uh, yeah, it's, it's great, fantastic. I don't know if every SaaS company can aspire to do that. Uh, so when the entrepreneur comes to you and says, oh yes, my business is booming, I need to rev up and I need to invest more, you need to make sure you ask the right questions. Is this business truly viable? What's the business model? Show me the metrics to say that it is healthy because I also agree that in most SaaS businesses, the first mover advantage and the lion's share goes to the, uh, you know, the leader. So one should not shy away from spending when the growth is required as long as you make sure you ask the questions and making sure it is uh, you know, healthy. Uh, one topic that keeps coming is churn and you know in the initial stages it may not be a factor but as you try to scale up churn is a big big determinant in in terms of how good your business is going to scale up 
and a lot of people uh, kind of react too late uh, when the churns uh, hit you. Uh, I would strongly encourage that as you develop the product that you instrument sufficiently because for the backend analytics to work, you, there has to be upfront instrumentation because even after a customer has adopted, you got to be tracking how effectively are they using, how many people are using it, how many of their business processes are, are uh, related to this and so on and so forth because if those trends kind of decline, you should be aware that there is a chance of churn happening here. So it's very important to watch out for all those things. <clears throat> Can you perhaps throw a little bit more flavor on the quality of revenues? That's something that you sort of talked a lot about, but you know, what have you seen done correctly? What are the best practices around measuring quality of revenues? So uh, at a high level, you, uh, I look at things uh, organic versus inorganic. So you are doing, you know, Google AdWords, uh, Outbrain, you know, what is the bang for the buck for all this spend as it relates to, you know, people coming in. And then you look at the organic methods you might employ, whether it is a blog, some industry specific, niche specific, offline event, conference. Uh, one of the interesting correlations I found in my experience uh, advising companies is the number of actual signups. So visitors move to, uh, you know, uh, signups, signups to trials, trials to freemium, and so on and so forth. Uh, those visitors who had come through the organic route, the conversion rates tend to be much higher. I don't know what your experience has been. So these are some of the things you have to uh, uh, look for uh, when, it look, when you look at the quality of revenues, saying, uh, you know, I am going to push the throttle, I am going to do a lot of spend, but before you go out and do a lot of spend, make sure that how are the revenues being generated, what's the quality of the customer, are you in the right segment for your product that you're talking about? Because even if it's a horizontal offering, maybe perhaps there is certain uh, variance or certain value that your product is much more appropriate to certain verticals. So this is what I'm talking about, trialing the product, trialing the segment you want to play in, and make sure that the revenues that you're coming, uh, coming in are healthy. Great. So did you make comments? Yeah, I think one of the things that I want to highlight is the role of marketing as you get into this phase. I, I, you know, uh, that's one issue that I see particularly with Indian entrepreneurs uh, that uh, the focus is still very much, uh, you know, sales-based approaches and uh, the pull factor that is critical, particularly in the SaaS industry, is something that. You, you know, there are not enough people in India that really understand that. So to get a good marketing person here to help you build that is harder. Um, and uh, in the US, this, this has been understood. There are enough people that are available. So I think the marketing aspect in terms of creating pull at this stage when you believe that your model is well understood, you, you know, either direct sales or channel, but you know, you've understood how to get a sales converted uh, from, a, from a lead to a conversion and you've got your product and your onboarding process well understood, at that point, you know, marketing can play a big role in, in your skilling. And particularly for when you're looking at hyper growth, marketing can be a very, very big driver there. So uh, you need to drive that. Great. Okay. Uh, so this is sort of, you know, the, the uh, what we've discussed so far is really to make sure that you are being honest to yourself uh, as, the, as, the, as the entrepreneur or from the board member perspective, that these are things you would look at before you say, okay, now we can step on the gas. So I'd like to sort of switch gears and actually talk about the phase that we have stepped on the gas. And what are the things that you've seen that have worked? Uh, what are the things that have not worked? So Kaushik, you know, you've done that with, uh, with, with the two companies. You're in the process of doing the second one. What is your experience around mm -hmm. and probably flavor on marketing, channels, SIs, all this sort of thing. Yes, so I think mm, one thing when you build the first version of products is that you want everyone sitting in the same location close to the customer. Yeah, so when we built port-wise, it was very Swedish. All decisions were very informal at the coffee table and all these things. And we got a fantastic product in place. But then Europe is very fragmented. If you go from Sweden to Denmark, decision making is different. Even Norway, and they don't like each other either because neighboring countries normally are in wars although Sweden was 350 years back. Uh, so when we came to that inflection point and we got expansion funding, I'll talk about issues. The issues was we were very Swedish. Swedish, no technology, they don't know marketing at all, and even not sales. Then we put a management team in UK. UK knows how to talk, 
but they don't have the technology. Uh, and then we went to had India and US operations, and our learning was that our product was too complex, uh, too Swedish, uh, so we went very high end. Uh, so we, from that perspective, instead of playing a complete in, uh, platform horizontal play, we focused on two verticals, government sector in North Europe, Sweden, Germany, and then bank and finance, mainly for emerging markets, but also US. Uh, so we said, okay, this is a business need, how you fit it in. So we learned badly from it that our company wasn't ready for scale. Uh, having a new person, a new team coming up, they couldn't be part of this coffee table discussions, get the features through, onboard customers that quickly. Uh, and that's why when we went to Nevales, I said, okay, let's pick a market. I won't do the Swedish mistake. You won't pick a market with nine million people, and you do go to US, because it's too expensive. So pick India, fairly cost effective. You can iterate three versions of the product with very little money, uh, and then learn it very deeply, but build in scale in the beginning. Uh, where we had a lot of issues with Portwise, sales guys could open an account, but doing a demo, getting the data center place, doing onboarding, and then doing the production setting, etc. We failed, and we were very, very slow. For instance, JP Morgan, I closed that account. It took me two years to close the account. Although we earned a lot of mo millions of dollars, and still are, uh, it took that long. Even banks over here, we closed Yes Bank. It took us probably nine months to get them up and running, and 12 months before we get the money. So if we didn't have VC funding, we wouldn't be sustainable. So now we do like Amrish, 12 months up front, test the product very short, onboarding quickly, and then don't go too wide. When you work for SI, you have to have a very niche offering that fits perfectly and not competing. So then their interests will be more aligned. We chose the SI model, it fit us because they take new products. Data centers are good. Their problem is they have these five nines. So taking a new product is very, very risky. So go for someone who has to acquire new customers, new projects, uh, that's better. Great. So, Sandeep, from a, you've been involved in a couple of companies that have, you know, one that's sort of getting, hitting the growth phase, one which you talked about, so maybe you throw some flavor on the companies yeah. that you've been involved in. Yes, I think, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll compare and contrast uh, Dindin and, uh, and Scalark. And, uh, you know, afterwards, if DD or, or Varun want to beat me up, that's a different thing. But, so, you know, with, with Dindin, uh, the focus of the market was really the prosumer segment, right? So, there were, uh, uh, web collaboration software, competing with a WebEx, going after uh, small and medium businesses. But really the, the decision maker was, was the business owner and you could think of them as a prosumer. And uh, it was an open source uh, tool, uh, delivered on demand. And uh, the challenge that uh, they faced was, you know, initial sales happened uh, because of the open source community and they built a, built a good sort of, you know, brand in the open source community. But then to take it broader and sell it in the in the enterprise space where the big dollars were, right? That's where WebEx was was prevalent, and to get people to pay uh, that uh, or even small and medium businesses, you had to really get the marketing engine right. And I think that's where the where the problem where they struggle. And uh, DD, did, you know, for various reasons, decided to stay in India. This is uh, you know he was a CEO, the founder of the company, and. Uh, to build a marketing sort of engine sitting in India, in my view, based on that experience, is very tough. You have to, particularly if the market is market was the U.S. Right, the market was the U.S. Uh, uh, primarily, not as much uh, emerging markets. So with ScaleArc, uh, the play is an enterprise play. Uh, the companies that we're going after are, you know, large users of databases and so on. And so, uh, very early, we said, okay, you know, this is a market where Having a perception that you are the largest and the you know player in the market, the market is maybe relatively new, but you are the leader in the market, and the, you know, so you have to give a perception that there is a established market, and you are the leader in the market. So how do you create that? So very early on, you know, Varun, after proving his uh, product here in the Indian market, we you know he relocated to the U.S. and subsequently uh, has built the team, you know, sales team there, everything uh, over there. And uh, I would say the decision in terms of the, you know, moving the, the needle and getting the, uh, you know, from the initial customers to the next phase, the biggest challenge was moving the, you know, Varun moving to the U.S. and that mindset of actually being in the market in which you are selling. And, uh, and then, you know, that, that allowed him to convince salespeople to join him, that allowed, you know, the, the marketing person to come on board and so on. So I think that's a very interesting experience across both those. So, so I think you know all hands on deck where your customers are. Yeah. I mean, that's, absolutely. Uh, I think that's very critical. 
uh, because uh, and you know again although the in both cases the the, uh, the product development team is here mm -hmm. and that again the other challenge that you would find is that if your market is abroad and your you know product development team is here is how do you make sure that they are fully in sync with where the product market fit is and uh, for example with with scale art when we started seeing this uptake the product you know the product team wasn't ready Hmm. And I think you know, Kaushik, you both brought this point. And we sold, we delivered, we deployed, and it worked for a, for a certain while. But as it scaled, it started running into problems. And uh, so this was a product scaling issue that we discovered. As our uh, and if Varun hadn't been there in the U.S. working with those customers uh, day in day out, I think we would probably be in a much you know I would be not be having this discussion over scale art. But because he was there, he was able to handle those issues and bring those. Uh, you know, uh, concerns of the customers back to the product team here, and uh, and get it resolved very quickly. So, uh, in this particular situation, sounds like to your point earlier, not just the operational part of of the delivery, but the PR part of it, the marketing part of it, the recruitment part of it, all those combined, and said you need to be where the customer. I think Abhishek brought up this point. I think he mentioned the three elements, right? right. The, the product has to be right, the operational, you know, your operational metrics and have to be working, and your sales and your channel approach has to be working, right? All three have to be in place. Great. So, Amish, now, <coughs> now that you have, uh, you know, tick, checked all those boxes, how are you thinking about sort of the next level? Are you putting your own salespeople? Are you looking at channel partners? How are you thinking about the next growth phase, uh, you know, for your company? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's, we're looking at direct sales, really. Um, um, to, it's a very small number of them uh, in two or three different places and uh, try to get an idea of what those markets really are without having to spend too much money. Uh, but I think that's a, that's a tip of the iceberg, really. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of preparation really went uh, before that and I think that like everything that that contributed that con I think would contribute 90% of the success or the failure of uh, um, getting into international market um, the fun one thing that we have done across these three things product operations and sales acquisition engine um, uh, I, I, I think uh, which, which is in uh, this kind of little fluffy you know uh, these, these are not number but uh, the honesty in organization about um, about sustainability of this business, uh, and, and you know th this is beyond all the numbers and everything that we are talking about. Um, is, you know, we, we all the VP levels we have Monday sync as we call it Monday meeting, and uh, I, I think the fundamental question in SaaS is SaaS is basically. You know, I'm going to give you such a useful thing that month on month, year on year, you would want to use it. Really, it's going to be so useful, and I'm going to. It's going. The value of this is going to be X, and I'm going to ask you for one tenth of X. That, that is what the business is, and uh, if that is not happening, really, um, if all the num so numbers are one thing, and you can fool around around numbers. Really, I mean, uh, the entrepreneurs can fool around, and, and the employees can fool around. Um, the, the point is, the fundamentally, do you think that you have really something that everybody is dying for? Right? I mean, it's been three years; people have been using, they are giving you feedback. That, that, that understand that that confidence has to be there, and there has to be very truthful, transparent communication, both on on the fluffy, uh, in the the the. The non uh, number way and the number way uh, of looking at everything uh, should have happened before you step on the pedal. And once you have that confidence, then you can. Then you. So what we are doing is basically repeating what we did in India. The what we're saying is, can we just go and repeat the same thing that we did in India in other places, which are India-like? So, for example, we're not going to Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to Malaysia because unit economics are similar to India. Got it. Okay. Great. So, Venkat, um, you're on a board of a company which, you know, the metrics look right, you've done your thing, you're confident. What have you seen done well and what have you seen not done so well now that the management team and you guys have agreed that you're going to step on the gas? What I've seen not done well are lost opportunity. Too many SaaS companies I found leave money on the table. 
you know, there are these fancy terms, the expansion MRR, negative churn, etc. But basically, it's upselling, cross-selling. So if you are ready to push the gas, you've made all, you know, all the right decisions, you think the product is there, focus on account management. Upsell and cross-sell, maximize with your existing customers the uh, revenue share. That is one good thing, you know, minimum basic thing uh, that every SaaS company should uh, try and do uh, as a first step. Uh, the other thing is uh, conversion. So it's okay, it has to be high touch when you are at the initial stage, but once you are uh, scaling, uh, you have to somehow figure out a low touch model. You cannot afford to be high touch. Uh, so what that means is somehow bring potential uh, you know, uh, customers to your website, website demo, demo should seamlessly move into a trial, make the you know, sign up for the trial e as simple as possible. Once they sign up, uh, make sure you have some kind of a payment mechanism so that like the conversion is absolutely critical as you think through at this, uh, at this level and make it easy for them to sign up, make them easy to pay and turn into a paying customer. So thank you, Paris. I uh, really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you.